Chapter Two of English Men of Science by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey. Chapter Two, Qualities. Energy, size of head, health, perseverance, practical business habits, memory, independence of character, mechanical aptitude, religious bias, truthfulness. In this chapter I will speak of the qualities which the returns specify as most conspicuous in scientific men, and I shall endeavour to make them tell their own tale by quoting anonymous extracts from their communications. Some of these qualities are common to all men who succeed in life, others, such as the love for science, are more or less special to scientific men. We will begin with the general qualities, with the view of obtaining as exact an idea as may be of the degree in which they are present in the leaders of science of the present day, neither exaggerating nor underestimating. Energy When energy, or the secretion of nervous force, is small, the powers of the man are overtasked by his daily duties, his health gives way, and he is soon weeded out of existence by the process of natural selection. When moderate, it just suffices for the duties and ordinary amusements of his life. He lives, as it were, up to his income, and has nothing to spare. When it is large, he has a surplus to get rid of, or direct, according to his tastes. It may break out in some illegitimate way, or he may utilize it, perhaps in the pursuit of science. It will be seen that the leading scientific men are generally endowed with great energy. Many of the most successful among them have labored as earnest amateurs in extra professional hours, working far into the night. They have climbed the long and steep ascent from the lower to the upper ranks of life. They have learned where the opportunities of learning were few, they have built up fortunes by perseverance and intelligence, and at the same time have distinguished themselves as original investigators in non-renumerative branches of science. There are other scientific men who possess what is sometimes called quiet energy. Their vital engine is powerful, but the steam is rarely turned fully on. Again, there are others who have fine intellects without much energy, but these later classes are quite in the minority. The typical man of science has been at full work from boyhood to old age, and has exuberant spirits and love of adventure in his short holidays when the engine of his life runs free, temporarily detached from its laborious tasks. We must be on our guard against estimating a man's energy too strictly by the work he accomplishes, because it makes great difference whether he loves his work or not. A man with no interest is rapidly fagged. Prisoners are well nourished and cared for, but they cannot perform the task of an ill-fed and ill-housed laborer. Whenever they are forced to do more than their usual small amount, they show all the symptoms of being overtasked and sicken. An army in retreat suffers in every way, while on the advance, being full of hope, may perform prodigious feats. In the following extracts, I insert everything that seems deserving of mention as regards the energy of either parent. It will be observed how strong is the tendency for the primary quality to be transmitted hereditarily. Speaking generally of these and all other extracts printed in this book, I should give the following explanation. Whenever anything is interpolated by me, it is put in square brackets. All proper names are replaced by dots, because I do not wish to administer to the love gossip. It is indeed impossible to prevent intimate friends from sometimes guessing the names of the author, but I have taken care that nothing is inserted which can cause annoyance. I have taken some trifling editorial liberties such as occasionally working the words of the question into the answer when the latter was too curt to explain itself and in a few cases the third person has been turned into the first for the sake of uniformity extracts from returns energy much above the average forty cases one travelling almost continually from eighteen forty six up to the present time restless all life accustomed to extremely rough travel often months without house or tent, of mind restless. Father, very energetic, restless, in old age travelled considerably, mentally restless. Mother, quiet and delicate. 2. When young, and to estimate thirty or more, worked habitually till 2 and 3 a.m., often all night, travelled much in various climates, much endurance of fatigue and hard living, of mind, has risen to the highest position in his branch of science and conducts an enormous correspondence on a variety of technical and scientific subjects father very considerable energy both in body and mind mother below the average in bodily energy but remarkably active mentally 
three when fishing or shooting my only occupation during the holidays i am the whole day on my legs of mind in thirteen years i examined and named some forty thousand examples described some seven thousand species wrote some six thousand pages of printed matter carrying on at the same time a great deal of correspondence father i cannot say mother is active the whole day at the age of sixty-three she took sole charge of my child then but a few weeks old nursing it for three years night and day energy of mind equal to that of her body four remarkable energy and active of body and power of enduring fatigue and going without food extremely fond of and an adept at all field sports absentious of mind vigorous pursuit of scientific experiments and investigations of interest and management of money business transactions etc father active in field sports has ridden sixty miles before dinner abstemious energetic in mind mother much energy as shown by activity and power of enduring fatigue great physical courage and presence of mind in danger five remarkable for athletic exercises when at cambridge in early life encountered great fatigue with the army as blank during the blank war father great activity and immense energy in the practice of his profession a man of most powerful intellect six i have been and still am a strong walker both mountaineering and deer stalking i never knew what it was to be tired but after the hardest day was ready to start again with six hours sleep although in my sixty-seventh year i am still an indefatigable deer stalker seven strong when young walked many a time fifty miles a day without fatigue and kept up five miles an hour for three or four hours father remarkable energy of body up to the age of thirty as shown blank of mind remarkable energy from early youth to his death brought on by accident at seventy three when he was actively engaged and ever in preparing for experiments official and of a very multifarious kind mother remarkable energy of mind in assisting her father in the preparation of his lectures and afterwards her husband in his official correspondence and writings after his death she wrote largely in magazines and estimates eighty five published suggestions for blank, certain improvements in administration eight when under twenty have walked twenty miles before breakfast when about thirty two walked forty five miles dined and danced till two in the morning without fatigue at the age of twenty six during fourteen days was only three hours per night in bed and on two of the nights was up all night preparing for blank, certain scientific work fond of mountaineering nine considerable energy and power of enduring fatigue rough travelling on small means in blank, partially civilized countries have rode myself on a skiff one hundred and five miles in twenty one hours whilst undergraduate at blank. rode in every race during my stay at the university rode two years in the university crew oxford and cambridge races father many examples of his energy in his blank life of mind considerable compiling and writing on a great variety of subjects will set the same time carrying on a system of blank observations and for years together mother energy of mind very similar to that of my father joining nightly in blank observations daily in writing or drawing ten very active in business preferring walking to the compulsory driving occupied fourteen or fifteen hours a day without distress restlessness kept under conscious restraint longing for adventurous travel but hindered mind i doubt whether any one in my profession has done more work if i may reckon the total work done in blank etc etc and i worked nearly as hard while a student father as a young man an active cricketer and volunteer officer a very earnest active man in business heavily engaged in it from the age of eighteen besides he took an active part in town affairs and the management of many associations mother a good walker very active in the management of her house although she had a very large family and took most diligent care of them she was always at work collecting all manner of things arranging describing corresponding painting copying she was never idle eleven i seem to possess the same unweariedness as my father and find myself trotting in the streets as my father used to father was very untiring he tells me he has ridden one hundred miles in a day he could walk up one of the north wales hills when nearly seventy and used to go long distances in london passing often from a walk into a run twelve in early life occasionally working the night through 
great adroitness at games fast runner got the prize for fencing at blank on board a man of war in eighteen blank did feats of agility such as growing up a rope hand over hand which none of the midshipmen would attempt father great amount of quiet energy in mind great energy and perseverance which lasted to the end of his life thus he had known little greek but studied it when an old man for the sake of his blank researches also aramaic mother active house mother thirteen habitually travelled by night without interfering with work of any kind carried on during the day active habits and great power of enduring fatigue fourteen i was in youth and early manhood bodily active a good runner and leaper excelling almost all my school fellows the school was a large one in both points and a persistent walker in mind during the best fifty years of my life i went through a large amount of brain work and vigorously pursued the several interests indicated in the enumeration of my several occupations father in bodily activity much like myself with the addition that he was a good swimmer in mind capable of great occasional exertion rather than of sustained effort mother in mind very energetic within a limited range always showed great courage fortitude and equanimity in her nursing duties whether of young or old was active persevering and remarkably successful fifteen at the age of sixty made a tour chiefly pedestrian of four weeks in the alps ascended sima di jazzi cross st Sidul pass walking sometimes thirty miles a day estimate sixty seven grouse shooting and deer stalking walk six miles daily to present date of mind see list and dates of works and papers an enormous amount of work father active disposition he let his family estate entered largely into mercantile pursuits and died abroad sixteen when young a very quick runner and jumper good shot with bow and arrow in middle age walked to extent of twenty five miles a day for many months forty miles in one day rarely tired of mind in early life any amount provided the support was interesting seventeen at times great fatigue has been gone through in connection with my profession in mind a good deal of continued power of brain work mental fatigue is a sensation not known father very energetic in mind remarkably so having been ruined in early life he articulated himself to a solicitor when he was thirty-five years of age procured good practice and wrote a small technical book on law mother loved to go through much fatigue in mind very energetic added greatly to the income of her family by her writings eighteen active bodily work and absolute necessity of my being without it my epigastrium would gnaw itself into fiddle strings in mind my scientific works must answer this question they are very considerable father decidedly active and energetic used to go out fossil hunting when it was too late to follow his occupation which involved out-of-door work lasting all day and fatiguing to the muscles mother very industrious nineteen excelled at school and college in athletic sports especially in long jumping eighteen feet in mind almost incapable of fatigue up to the age of thirty-eight usually engaged in literary work until long after midnight father remarkably active habits a great reader were not engaged in drawing and writing twenty excellent walker great endurance of fatigue facts are given in mind active mental effort all my life have had abundance of active employment am now doing duty as blank numerous honorary officers of the first rank in importance and labour father energetic with considerable endurance good swimmer in mind he had much the same employment as myself he took an active share in science politics and religion mother active habits she had great power of doing work and carrying on business twenty one when a boy of thirteen i walked forty-eight miles in one day fifty the next and about twenty the third when grown up my powers were ordinary certainly not above average in mind indolent disinclined to work unless with a large object n b i insert this moderate statement because my correspondent adheres to it verbally and gives facts and reasons which i cannot controvert nevertheless if energy is to be measured by work actually accomplished and if my correspondent's work be compared with that of other men the estimate of his energy will be prodigiously increased father when a young man he and two brothers walked sixty miles in one day much mental energy ready for all purposes when old he was astonished at the amount of work in 
blank he did when young mother ordinary both bodily and mental twenty two has done his chief brain work between ten p m and two a m besides all the day labour rests perfectly during a night railway journey father great energy and very active capable of enduring great fatigue twenty three active and energetic from infancy to eighty-four years of age in mind i must leave my works to answer this question but i believe i have been a hard worker during the whole period of my existence and be no doubt of it father energetic both in body and mind muscular a great reader mother delicate but active and intelligent twenty four a strong walker and oarsman can write more rapidly than any man i ever met thirty folios of seventy-two words equal to two thousand one hundred and sixty words an hour in mind i have always worked long hours and very fast father remarkable energy and endurance notwithstanding asthma very hard working as a blank mother physically weak but has had a large family has done a great deal of original as well as of steady work twenty five i am a hard rider with hounds fond of mountaineering and not easily tired father an active man all his life riding every day and always about although over eighty twenty six energy shown by much activity and well sighted health power of resisting fatigue i and one other man were alone able to fetch water for a large party of officers and men utterly prostrated other facts given in illustration of undoubted energy in mind shown by vigorous and long continued work on the same subject as twenty years on blank and nine years on blank father great power of endurance although feeling much fatigue and after consultations after long journeys very active not restless in mind habitually very active as shown in conversation with a succession of people during the whole day twenty seven considerable enduring power in fulfilling any given task or duty have dissected continually for three or four weeks eight or nine hours a day devoting some sixteen hours to the work at critical times in mind considerable wrote and superintended first edition of blank giving instructions to artists regarding from two hundred to three hundred woodcuts correcting press etc without assistance in about seven months all this in addition to professional work hard work for mind as well as body twenty eight energetic in mind extraordinarily so both in administrative and in original work father energetic author of i think more than seventy scientific memoirs twenty nine formerly great power of railway travel without fatigue in mind active and energetic in a very high degree as shown by the amount of his official and private work father always on horseback travelled very constantly and rapidly steady in pursuit of an object he would break in horses with great skill and patience would learn languages with great perseverance even after fifty years of age mother very energetic in inquiries thirty great activity at cricket and football up to age of twenty five captain of blank eleven for five years used to row a great deal in heavy boats thirty one i possess considerable bodily energy and when young excelled in fencing swimming and the high jump in mind have worked hard with my brain for the last thirty-five years almost without intermission father considerable bodily energy and a good pedestrian mother sluggish bodily powers but in mind most energetic when once roused to action by a subject that interested her feelings thirty two sufficiently patient of ordinary fatigue cold and hunger to enable me to enjoy travelling in unfrequented countries when my companions suffered much discomfort in mind can commonly work from twelve to fourteen hours a day without any remarkable amount of exhaustion father capable of enduring fatigue thirty three this is a case of extraordinary mental activity as shown by evidence which i do not feel justified in quoting it was rewarded by a success notwithstanding serious impediments in boyhood father a most energetic man all for practical pursuits mother an unusually strong mind and steady love and search for knowledge thirty four walking from cambridge to london in a day at the age of sixty eight ascended the piers corvatsch in the engadine in mind facts evidencing considerable energy are quoted father fond of exercise a good walker 
Mother, decidedly active bodily habits. 35. I am decidedly lazy, but with due stimulus could always get through a great amount of physical work, and was rather the better for it. In mind, as a boy, I worked for three months all day and all night, with not more than four or five hours sleep. When full of a subject and interested in it, I have written for seven or eight hours without interruptions, and without feeling any notable fatigue. 36. In early life as a boy, I was engaged in business from 12 to 14 hours a day, yet always found time to study and make my own instruments. Later on, my studies and scientific work were always accomplished after business hours, and it was generally my habit to commence work after dinner, and to work in science until 2, 3, or 4 in the morning, and to begin work in business again at 9. I never thought of rest if I had anything in hand of interest. Father remarkably active and capable of sustaining an amount of bodily exertion which should have destroyed the health of most men for example i have known him sustain great fatigue for eighteen hours out of the twenty-four hour for months at a stretch a great walker in mind of indomitable activity a great reader always at work in applying discoveries in blank to the arts an untiring worker in anything he undertook mother Busily active, great and rapid reader of current literature, perhaps, and read almost every book of interest in fiction which appeared. 37. Used to work all day at business and one half or three quarters of the night at science. From Saturday afternoons to Monday mornings would walk 40 to 50 miles in pursuit of a branch of natural history. Could work hard at business all day and a very anxious business. And at evening and night would work hard at two branches of science found a wonderful relief in science father energetic in traveling great energy in business 38 for several years was engaged in full medical practice at the same time was a lecturer on blank and engaged in investigations on for which the royal medal was awarded by the royal society father and mother both of active habits 39 in professional life i have often been up three successive nights without distress but did not like a fourth if it came Consider that my limit in mind wrote blank, a considerable work, between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m., after professional hours. All the time that I have devoted to science has been stolen from strictly professional engagements, but more often from myself. 40. Considerable power in earlier days of enduring mental fatigue and of taking up without difficulty a considerable range of subjects. Example. I was for a little while at 17 to 20 in teaching and I contrived in my scanty intervals of leisure to read a very large quantity of Greek and Latin, and to become, without any external assistance, a very fair mathematician. My correspondent occupies a high official position in which considerable mathematical knowledge is essential. I learned also Italian at this time. 41. I should say considerable, judging by the number of things I have been able to learn and to do since adult age. 42. I think considerable in mind have commonly had it said of me that it was wonderful how i got through so much work father was well known as a hard worker mother a great reader taught herself greek and hebrew and learnt german a letter life to read luther and other theological writers in the original a great student of theology cases of energy below the average two cases one no remarkable energy of body in mind never capable of a large amount of brain work for years have regarded myself as defective in brain power. The actual performance of this correspondent is considerable and of a very high order. Father. In early life fond of athletic sports and an enthusiastic sportsman. Energy of mind very remarkable, shown in early university and professional life and all subsequent occupations. He wrote a large number of publications on subjects of blank and blank controversy. Mother. Energy of mind remarkable, zeal in pursuits of interest, excessive. 2. Constitutionally languid, with a strong wish for greater energy and more power of enduring fatigue. In mind, energetic, as far as health permits. Much occupied professionally, but when well capable of vigorous following up the science of blank in leisure hours. Father, energetic in body as far as his health allowed. In mind, very energetic. His brain work from an early age was very large in amount, and he was vigorous and sanguine about anything he undertook. Mother, very languid, incapable of any bodily exertion, very little energy of mind, too languid to take much interest in anything beyond her own family. 
Size of head. I may mention that energy appears to be correlated with smallness of head, a fact which is well illustrated here, although the average circumference of head among the scientific men is great. Energy is also, as we have seen, strongly marked among them, but it is much more strongly marked among those who have small heads. I have 99 returns, many of which I have verified myself, using the hat maker's whalebone hoop, and measuring inside the hats. It appears that the average circumference of an English gentleman's head is 22 and one quarter to 22 and a half inches. Now I have only 13 cases under 22 inches, but 8 cases of 24 inches or upwards. The general scientific position of the small-headed, who are mostly slender, but not necessarily short, and large-headed men, seems equally good. But the fact is conspicuous that, out of the thirteen of the former, there are only two or three who have not remarkable energy, and out of the eight of the latter, there is only one who has. A combination of great energy and great intellectual capacity is the most effective of all conditions, but like the combination of swiftness and strength in muscular powers, it is very rare. Health The excellence of the health of the men in my list is remarkable, considering that the majority are of middle and many of advanced ages. One quarter of them state that they have excellent or very good health. A second quarter have good or fair. A third have had good health since they attained manhood, and only one quarter make complaints or reservations. Here are two examples of excellent health in which some details are given. 1. Only absent from professional duties two days in thirty years. Only two headaches in my life. The next is from a correspondent who is between seventy and eighty years of age. 2. Never ill for more than two or three days except with neuralgia. No surgical operations except inoculation, drawing of one tooth, and cutting of corns. I may add a characteristic biographical extract from the Times, October 31st, 1873, relating to the late Sir Henry Holland, who was on my list. Certain it is, as all who have fallen in with him by sea or land will attest, that he might be seen in all climates, in the Arctic regions or the tropics, on the prairies or the pyramids, in precisely the same attire, the black dress coat in which he hurried from house to house in Mayfair. Yet he never had a serious illness till his last. There was not a day, probably not an hour, when he could not boast of the mens sana in corpore sano, and without headache or heartache he attained the extraordinary age of eighty-six. It is positively startling to observe in these returns the strongly hereditary character of good and indifferent constitutions. I have classified the entries, each by giving the health of the scientific man, of his father and of his mother respectively, and find as follows. First, a long row of such terms as these, excellent, 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 or good, good, good. Then comes another row in which some ailment is specified by the scientific man as affecting himself, and as having also affected one or other of his parents. Examples. 1. Excellent but hay fever. Father, excellent, but severe hay fever. 2. Good in early life, subject to headache. Father, good, subject to headache. 3. Delicate in early life, one lung seriously affected. Mothers, delicate and physical. I can find only two cases, neither very strongly marked, in which both parents are described as unhealthy, although marriages between such persons are not infrequent. The returns seem to show that the issue of these marriages are barely capable of pushing their way to the front ranks of life. All statistical data concur in proving that healthy persons are far more likely than others to have healthy progeny, and this truth cannot be too often illustrated until it has taken such hold of the popular mind that considerations of health and energy shall be of recognised importance in questions of marriage, as much so as the probabilities of rank and fortune. I may mention as a fact that corroborates my belief in the exceptionally good physique of scientific men that I find the average height of those who have sent me returns to be half an inch above that of their fathers. Perseverance Steady perseverance is the third quality on which great stress is laid, but this might have been anticipated and it is unnecessary to quote many instances. Here are a few. I have probably beyond the average steadiness of determination, even when the subject is distasteful. 2. Steadiness decidedly marked. 3. Determination never to leave unaccomplished a matter once taken in hand. 4. Great continuity and steadiness. 5. Steady and intense perseverance. 6. Very persevering, not discouraged by defeat. 
7. Determination to succeed when possible. My motto being, Whatever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, for the night soon cometh when no man can work. 1. I do all things at a white heat, but never tire of the pursuit. 9. Continuous pursuit of certain studies from an early age. 10. Steadiness and perseverance in the pursuit of an object that is my most distinctly marked peculiarity. 11. The most prominent are perseverance and industry. A willing mind and determination to persevere is, in my opinion, the most direct road to success. We must, however, exercise a sound judgment in the selection of subjects on which to exercise our thoughts. I do not think it necessary to quote the instances where either parent is also spoken of as being remarkably persevering. These may be taken for granted. I find that the father is referred to in strong terms eight times, and the mother only twice. As I set off to the above, impulsiveness is not confessed to by a single physicist, chemist, or mechanician. It is equally absent in their parents, with the exception of the mother of one of them. Among the remaining men of science, I only find five cases, but these are mostly combined with some tenacity of purpose, and they are all inherited. Practical Business Habits some prevalence of practical business habits might also have been anticipated, but they proved to be much more common than I had expected. Among those who have sent me returns, I count no less than 17 who are active heads of great commercial undertakings. There are also 10 medical men in the highest rank of practice, and 18 others who fill or who have filled important official posts. Here are some answers to my special inquiries. 1. A most eminent biologist wrote as follows, in reply to the inquiry whether he had any special tastes bearing on scientific success, in addition to those for his own light of investigation. I have no special talent except for business, as evinced by keeping accounts, being regular in correspondence, and investing money very well. It is clear that method and order are essential to the man who hopes to deal successfully with masses of details. 2. I believe I may say that my organ of order is highly developed. Of my collection of some 7,000 birds' skins, every one is always in its place, ticketed with name, etc., or by my own hand. I spend much time, perhaps too much, in putting things straight. 3. I believe I am reckoned a good chairman in public meetings, and I always find that administrative and other work gravitates towards my hands. 4. My professional life is strictly methodical. Every working day is still mapped out into hours, half hours, and quarters. Fully one half of those who state that they possess business habits in a decided degree accredit one or both of their parents with the same faculty. Only two of my correspondents speak of being deficient in business capacities. Both these are physicists. The following quotation may with propriety be inserted here, although the first named quality independence is the subject of a future chapter. I attribute all the knowledge I have acquired and my success I may have had chiefly to three qualities all of which I believe I inherited. First, independence of judgment, which prompted me to learn for myself what I wanted to know. Secondly, earnestness, determination, and perseverance in acquiring such knowledge, often under difficulties, and in the face of routine business occupation. And thirdly, a business-like, practical, logical way of looking at things, which enabled me to direct attention to the important and relevant, neglecting the unimportant and irrelevant points in which I had to study and do. Memory Memory is very variable in power and character, perhaps no other quality is more so. It is an important ingredient in that aggregate of faculties which form general scientific ability, as is shown by the fact that about one quarter of the men on my list possess it in high degree, but it is not an essential one because it is defective in about one case in fourteen. A good memory is of greater importance to the young student who has much to learn than to the advanced philosopher who has chiefly to reflect, and who knows where to refer for information. Memory is usually defective in persons of small ability, but not invariably so, even among idiots it may be sharp. There are two cases of this record in the autobiography of the late Mrs. Somerville, page 92. One cannot but suspect some exaggeration in the statements and feel regret that the cases were not fully inquired into, both as regards the precise power of memory and the degree of development of the other faculties. She says the first idiot, he never failed to go to Kirk, and on returning home he could repeat the sermon word for word, saying, Here the minister coughed, here he stopped to blow his nose. She then speaks of another idiot, who knew the Bible so perfectly, that if you asked him where such a verse was to be found, he could tell without hesitation and repeat the chapter. 
I have sorted such of the replies as are interest into the following groups. 1. Good verbal memory, as for prose and poetry, 6 cases. 2. Good memory for facts and figures, 9 cases. 3. Memory for form, 6 cases. 4. Good memory for names in natural history, 4 cases. 5. Good memory, no details, 5 cases. 6. Fitful and peculiar memory, 6 cases. 7. Bad memory, 7 cases. Total number of noteworthy cases, 43. I have not included in the above a few instances in which the scientific man has described his own memory simply as good, nor others in which he has made no remark, except that one of his parents had very good memory. The hereditary character of this quality is abundantly illustrated. Good verbal memory, as for prose and poetry. 1. Very great, both for facts and words. I could in my earlier days often retain poetry after two perusals, and once learned it, it was seldom forgotten. I have seldom met a quicker or more retentive memory in any one. 2. After reading over a lecture or a speech of an hour's duration three times, can recollect nearly the words as written for eight or ten days. I am informed verbally by this correspondent that he is obliged to abstain from writing out his addresses, etc., beforehand, otherwise he has found the memory of what he wrote to be so strong and exacting as to make it difficult to him to deviate from it and accommodate his language to the current temper of his audience. Mother, excellent memory. 3. Considerable, both verbal and objective. Great facility in quotations, familiarity with large collections of coins and specimens. Father and mother, both good memories. 4. In childhood, all the psalms, old version, much old English poetry. Afterwards, nearly the whole Latin grammar, Eton, Virgil, Ovid, Lucan, still later, considerable parts of the Iliad, Odyssey, etc., could be and partially can still be repeated ex memoria. Zoological, botanical, mineralogical, and paleontological names in abundance. 5. My memory was very good. I remember as a boy to have read Schiller's Thirty Years' War. I could afterwards, without effort, say pages of the work by heart. 6. At school I used to learn in a single evening 100 lines of Virgil and repeat them correctly in the morning. Father. Very good. Good memory for facts and figures. 1. Next to no verbal memory. Good memory for facts and figures. 1. Next to no verbal memory, but good for facts small or great which will fit into any chain of reasoning. 2. Of moderate verbal memory, but strongly retentive of facts and figures so far as they are related to any subject on or in which I was engaged. Father. Memory very retentive, but not systematic. He had a great amount of information, but had not great acquirements. His familiarity with scripture was, however, remarkable. Mother. Very retentive for small facts and figures. 3. My memory of things learnt early in life, as dates, rules, examples of grammar, etc. Very retentive but of all isolated facts of subsequent occurrence as the birthdays of my children and the dates of events of my life i am singularly destitute of retentive power on the other hand of whatever is linked by rational association with any subject in which i take an interest my memory is very good father the power of his memory was shown by the great range of his requirements he had greater power of remembering isolated facts than i have four i should say far above the average I can now refer to notebooks of thirty years past and select a special observation. In other words, it is a capital working memory. I never tried to learn pages of poetry, etc. In this I should probably have failed. 5. Memory exceedingly strong and retentive, especially of dates, figures and events. Father and mother both had good memories. 6. Great memory for figures can get up pages for examination before committees and dismiss them from memory afterwards. Strong recollection of scenery. 7. Very retentive memory, especially of acts, circumstances, and individuals. 8. Never kept a diary. Clear remembrance of events in childhood, with their dates in every year from the age of six onwards. Solve problems better out of doors than in the study. Can forget useless knowledge, such as formulae, rules, gossip, etc., very fast. 9. Bad memory for names and dates, but good as regards facts or circumstances principles in physical science are clearly retained father excellent memory for historical events including dates and names in ancient and modern history 
Mother, moderately good. Good memory for form. 1. Mother most treacherous except in certain respects. Vivid and generally very accurate as to places and visual images. As to thousands or perhaps tens of thousands of specimens and plants can remember the exact spot where each was gathered. As to a multitude of facts that should have interested me, my memory is a blank and the original impression revived in difficulty if at all. Very retentive and accurate as to the sequence of impressions from early childhood onwards. Father. Remarkably retentive memory, quoting long passages from classical authors not seen for a very long time previous. Shortly before his death at seventy-three, recited a long passage from Gibbon, not read for fifty years before. Mother, memory not reliable generally, but clinging strongly to special scenes and events. I recognized most of the animal forms which I have previously examined, but I forgot easily the details of their structure, also their systematic names. Specific, not generic. Likewise, I have a good memory for faces, but not for names of persons. Could never remember historical dates. 3. Great power of remembering forms and points of objective interest. None of numbers or abstract arguments, languages, poetry, etc. Soon lost if not kept up. 4. Strong local memory, especially of scenery. 5. Very good memory for ideas and general notions, also of persons and places seen. Verbal memory, not at all good. Mother, good memory. 6. Great memory for faces and objects once seen. A good memory for faces, for locality, for things, for events, for scientific facts, but not particularly good for figures or quantities, except in all necessary routine, as in prescribing and in subjects of lecture. Never fail to recall what I desired in my lectures. Father, an excellent memory, was a very first-rate whist player. Mother, an excellent memory, played a capital game at whist. Good memory for names in natural history. The power of recollecting a multitude of grotesque and barbarous names which all naturalists must possess to a considerable degree and which seems so extraordinary to persons who are not naturalists is hardly alluded to in these returns. It would appear that our most eminent naturalists are not very specially gifted among their fellow workers in this respect. Here are a few cases of a rather good memory of the kind. 1. Memory strong up to the age of 38. Still good and capable of recognising and naming probably between two and three thousand species of animals and plants, including fossil forms. Father, remarkable, capable of accurately repeating from memory the substance of speeches delivered at clerical and other meetings. 2. Retentive of botanical names, rather deficient in other respects, especially as to persons. 3. Retentive for nomenclature, but not for numbers or history. During practitional life, I have gone over the foraminiferae and remembered all their names. Good memory. No particulars given. 1. Very remarkable retentiveness of memory. Father good, mother very good. Full of anecdote. 2. Very good memory as far as my 85th birthday. 3. Very good. Father good. 4. Very retentive but not exactly accurate. 5. Retentive memory for what was of interest, and a very accurate. Father, retentive. 6. Very good as a boy and young man. Fitful and peculiar memory. 1. Occasionally remarkable, but very fitful. I have occasionally been able to repeat pages after once or twice reading. At other times, it is below the average. A power of eliminating and retaining the salient points of what I read if it interests me, but very bad memory for facts and details. 2. Although I can speak for an hour or two from a few notes, I could not repeat correctly a few sentences from memory. Father, remarkable for good verbal memory, could repeat pages of poetry and speeches without mistake, a striking contrast to my own memory. 3. My father and myself have memories of the same character, treacherous in matters of business, and very retentive of scraps of verse read over and learnt long ago. When my father was to have met me, a little boy returning from school the end of the half, he would forget it all about it. My engagements sometimes suffer, blank, from similar forgetfulness. 4. Memory very retentive in regard to incidents and events, but could never learn by rote except with great effort. Often surprise my patients by recollection of their symptoms, but am often at a loss to connect their names with their faces. Father, Memory remarkably retentive, especially as to the various events of his life and time. 
5. Memory very bad for dates and for learning by rote, but extraordinarily good in retaining a general or vague recollection of many facts. Father. Wonderful memory for dates. In old age, he told a person reading aloud to him a book only once read in his youth, the pastors which were coming. He knew the birthdays and those of the deaths, etc., of all his friends and acquaintances. 6. A peculiar memory, bad for names of persons, plants, places, etc., good for subjects connected with others, not bad for numbers. Father. A most marvellously retentive memory. He could relate minute details of historical occurrences, names of actors in politics, almost all he had ever read. He was a great reader, and was in consequence a most lively companion. Mother, not very good. Bad memory. 1. A physicist informs me that his memory is unable to retain even the commonest constants in habitual use, and that the selection of his special line of investigation was governed by his sense of this disability. 2. Bad memory. From boyhood, incapable of learning school tasks by heart, though retaining a knowledge of principles and methods. 3. I have a very poor memory. I was once a whole fortnight in recovering the name of blank, but I got it at last. I consider that all attempts at making me learn poetry, and in particular Latin poetry at school, were gross mistakes. I was never benefited in the least. Reasoning was my forte, and I could never do anything by rote. 4. A bad memory, especially for names. 5. Not possessed of a retentive memory, either in small matters or large ones, except in those in which I take a special interest. 6. I was always slow at learning. 7. Memory not retentive, very much under the influence of association and suggestion. Father. Memory very retentive as to principles, facts, instance, not much so as to names of persons and objects. Mother. Not retentive. Independence of character. We now come to the qualities that are of a special service to scientific men. Those already mentioned, of energy, health, steadiness of pursuit, business habits and memory, being of general utility. The first of these is independence of character. Fifty of my correspondents show that they possess it in excess, and it only two is below par. Here are a few examples. 1. Left, estimated 12, that is, ran away from a school where I had received injustice from the master. 2. Opinions in almost all respects opposed to those in which I was educated. 3. I have always taken my own independent line. My heresy prevented my advancement. 4. Preference for whatever is not the fashion. Not popular, not rich, not very able to help itself, yet with qualities unworthily overlooked or unjustly oppressed. The home atmosphere, which the scientific men breathed in their youth, was generally saturated with the spirit of independence. Examples 1. My father was extremely independent, in some respects more so than I am. He never altered the fashion of his dress, he never took off his hat to anyone in his life, and never addressed anyone as a squire. 2. My father was a liberal when liberalism, then styled Jacobinism, was highly obnoxious. An early denouncer of slavery, an advocate of religious liberty, a free trader when the world was protectionist, and an opponent of unrighteous war when war was most popular. He was for mitigating our criminal code when hanging was regarded as the sheet anchor, and, in a word, was politically and socially a very independent spirit. 3. My father, an exceedingly humane and courageous man, who was a master in the Royal Navy, would never, unless compelled, attend the flogging of a seaman, a punishment mercilessly unsparingly administered in his days, 1800-1815. 4. It was marked in my father, he held Jacobite opinions, when it was not very safe to hold them. 5. Maintenance by my father of religious and political creeds at a time when these creeds were unpopular and often disqualifying. In confirmation of the assertion that the scientific men were usually brought up in families characterised by independence of disposition, I refer to the strange variety of small and unfashionable religious sects to which they or their parents belonged. We all know that Dalton, the discoverer of the atomic theory, and Dr. Young, of the undulatory theory of light, were both Quakers, and that Faraday was a Sandemanian. So I find in these returns numerous cases of Quaker pedigree, and I know of one man, not as yet technically on my list, who was born a Sandemanian. There are also representatives of several other small specks, as Moravians and Bible Christians, and the Unitarians are numerous. 
it will be understood that the object of saying this is not to throw light on the religious tendencies of scientific men concerning which i shall have almost immediately to speak because so offhand a statement would mislead but to prove that they and their parents had the habit of doing what they preferred without considering the fashion of the day the man of science is thoroughly independent in character mechanical aptitude there is a prevalent taste for mechanics among scientific men whose peculiarity it is to be interested in things more than in persons one would have expected to find it developed among physicists and as a fact eight of them possess it in a high degree and similarly among mechanicians and engineers all of whom must possess it and four of whom testify to it but it seems just as strong among the rest here are instances and extracts chemistry one constructed a reflecting telescope with twelve inch aperture two ground polished and silvered a seven inch glass speculum and mounted it equatorially geology three considerable mechanical skill biology four always fond of constructing school nickname archimedes if i had followed my profession and should have been very successful as an engineer five very fond of mechanical contrivances invented and made my own toys as a child mechanical tastes are still largely indulged in intervals of leisure six special love of mechanics a good amateur cabinet maker and blacksmith made lithotrites seven talent for mechanics eight was extremely ingenious in devising modes of preserving and exhibiting objects of natural history nine strong natural inclination towards mechanism his present profession was accidental and against the grain ten and eleven aptitude for mechanism twelve a decided turn for mechanical pursuits both in arrangement and construction statistics thirteen fond of and quick in understanding machinery fourteen i always took great interest in mechanical improvement fifteen i often feel a positive pain in passing an object of which i do not comprehend the meaning and construction religious bias it appears that out of every ten scientific men seven call themselves members of the established churches of england and scotland or of the now established church of ireland and three belong to one or more of the following sects which i name in the order in which they are most numerously represented one none whatsoever two established church with qualification three unitarian four nonconformist five wesleyan six catholic seven bible christian there is much quaker and even some moravian blood but there are none who have sent me returns who still profess these creeds the creeds of the parents are somewhat more varied than the above and the unitarian element is stronger the religious feeling of men of science is necessarily of a peculiar character being thoughtful men they are probably more occupied with religious ideas than the generality of people but being exacting of evidence and questioners of authority they sturdily object to much that others accept easily but what is religion it is one of the vaguest of words let us try to express ourselves more clearly i think we may assume that the general tendency of scientific men is to take a philosophic view of life that is to show some disregard of the petty transient events which chiefly absorb the attention of mean minds and to feel most at peace when their thoughts are reposing on the larger and more enduring aspects of the moral and material world also it would be easy to show that no class in the community are more active as philanthropists than scientific men but these tendencies do not cover the meaning of the phrase religious bias in its technical sense so far as i understand that sense it compromises three elements one great prevalence of the intuitive sentiments so much so that conflicting matters of observation are apt to be laid aside out of sight and mind the intuitive sense of a supreme god who communes with our hearts and directs us two a sense of extreme sin and weakness as expressed by the liturgical phrase no power of ourselves to help ourselves though the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing without thee etc three revelation of a future life and of other matters variously interpreted by different sects with more or less satisfy the intuitive sentiments i did not enter into these details in framing my questions but simply asked in general terms whether or no my correspondence had a strong religious bias the interpretation i put on the answers which are subjoined is that religion in the sense of the third paragraph is not actively accepted by many of those who describe themselves as religiously inclined they seem singularly careless of dogma and exempt from mysterious terror 
also considering the independence of their disposition their energetic temperament and healthful physique i should think that religion in the sense of the second paragraph that of feeling sinful and weak would not express the views of many of them therefore i look on the intuitive sentiments as described in the first paragraph connected with a philosophic frame of mind and a tendency to achieve philanthropy as the most likely meaning of the phrase religious bias when it is used without any qualification by my correspondents especially by those who are unitarians in this sense at least there appear to be about eighteen instances of scientific men who have a decided religious bias being i should estimate at the rate of two or more in every ten but i am not able to state with certainty how many of these are religious in the sense of all the three paragraphs religious sentiments weak accompanied with more or less scepticism one being compelled to attend frequent chapels at college he for ten years afterwards refused to enter either church or chapel two the negative tendencies of my family may be abstinence of pity three religious feeling not great four sceptical five not much religious bias except in a boundless admiration of nature. 6. I gave up common religious belief almost independently from my own reflection. 7. Bias towards freedom of thought in religious matters. Intellectual interest in religious topics. 1. Entertained at an early age independent views regarding the resurrection and salvation of the heathen, which led to frequent disputes. 2. At school I became sceptic, and even worked out, in my own somewhat, at that time, reserved mind, a kind of idealism. I afterwards had a phase of religious fervour, but worked through it. 3. Given to theological ideas and not reticent about them. 4. Instinctive or original religious bias, though this may be in part due to early training. I take considerable pains in investigation of religious matters, one of my amusements being the collection of a considerable theological library, with the books of which I am familiar. Dogmatic Interest I have no more doubt about the plenary inspiration of scripture than I have about the simplest axiom in mathematics. I class this exception reply under dogmatic interest, because the remainder of the writer's brief communication highly suggests the dependent frame of mind that is characteristic of pity e.g. never received or asked a single favour or a single farthing for anything i ever wrote or did religious bias one religious bias two of a religious bias of thought three religious views liberal but strongly anti-materialistic four early religious impressions strong but have on the dogmatic side quite disappeared the belief in a permanent antithesis between good and evil irrespective of utilitarian results has survived with no keen sense of the need of a dogmatic basis for the belief five much religious bias of thought from early education six i have been the more biased towards religion in that my father and maternal grandfather lived it and did not prate about it i am personally only a combination of these two men in this respect please take the sense of what i have written and not the words seven religious bias of thought decided eight although firmly and thoroughly believing in christianity and accepting it as the guide of my life as far as i can understand it being also a regular attendant of the church of england still i cannot admit the right of that or any other church to teach dogmatically what truths are necessary for my salvation and the feelings which ever cause me to resent any interference with the liberty of conscience are quite as strong in me as they were in the breast of my ancestor when he gave up the land of his birth and property more than three hundred years ago my correspondent has shown marked instances of independence of character and has descended maternally from both flemish and french religious refugees and paternally from an english nonconformist who left his country and settled in america nine it is difficult to estimate one's own peculiarities, but I believe I may credit myself with more of the usual amount of blank and religious bias of thought. I have mixed and worked with Christians of most of the Protestant churches. 10. Strong religious feeling. My intention on entering blank was to devote myself to a missionary life in China, but my unexpected success in blank persuaded my friends to induce me to abandon my purpose on the grounds that i might serve god better in my new sphere at home i yielded to their arguments with great reluctance eleven intensely religious formerly in the evangelical sense a tract distributor promoter of prayer meetings bible classes etc excessive distaste to novels and fictions in any shape see indifference to dogma page one hundred thirty seven twelve i was brought up an ordinary member of the church but ultimately came to the conclusion that blank was essentially illogical blank 
I had the happiness of seeing my mother follow me into the blank church. I regret that I am unable with property to give fuller extracts from the most interesting and instructive replies of this correspondent. Religious Bias with Intellectual Skepticism 1. I have not cultivated independence of judgment in religious matters. I have shrunk from so doing in order to retain peace for my varied studies. 2. Much religious bias of thought, but no respect for revealed religion as a base for such a bias. 3. Religious bias towards natural theology strong, as distinguished from dogma of any kind. 4. I have perhaps a religious bias from early habits and associations, rather than from temperament. But I have always had more pleasure in sacred than in secular music, which perhaps shows the predominance of the emotional tendency. 5. A profound religious tendency capable of fanaticism, but tempered by no less profound theological scepticism. Next, as regards the effect of dogmatic teaching, or of creed on research, I had expected it to have been much more deterrent and hindering than the answers warrant. The suicide of the geologist Hugh Miller, whose brain gave way under the conflict between dogmatic creed and scientific doubt, is a terrible tale. One would have thought that the anathemas from the pulpits against most new scientific discoveries, as soon as they become capable of popular application, such as geological history, antiquity of man, and Darwinism, must have deterred many, and, as I have already shown, few of the sons of clergymen are on my list. Nevertheless, in answers to my direct inquiry, has the religious creed taught in your youth had a deterrent effect on the freedom of your researches? I am met with overpowering majorities of negatives. Seven or eight say no, justifying their assertion by various reasons to one who says yes, as is shown by the appended replies. These may be sorted into the four following groups. 1. No. Deterrent effect. 39 cases. 2. None. With emphasis. 12 cases. Examples. None whatever. Not in the least. Not in the slightest. Decidedly not. Certainly not. 3. None with various classes of reasons why it had not, 14 cases. 4. Has had a good and not a bad effect, 8 cases. Further specimens of the first two groups, no, with or without emphasis, are needless, but I will give extracts from the remainder divided under convenient heads. Have no dread of inquiry, 1. I do not think so. At the time when I held strongly the blank dogmatic system, I never could apprehend any dread of the results of free inquiry, 2 none whatever, absolute and fearless faith in the truth. 3. I was left free to choose my own religion, and I believe that there is no real antagonism between revealed religion and the study of nature. Religion and science have different spheres. 1. No, it, religious creed, has no point of contact with chemistry. Indifference to dogma. 1. Not in the slightest degree, but the method of science has taught me not to put any confidence in creeds or dogmatic statements of any kind. There is correspondent is the track distributor, etc., of 11 of those having religious bias in page 133. Liberality of early religious teaching. 1. None. The teacher was not severe or exclusive in any degree. It was the ordinary teaching of the Church of England. 2. My religious creed from infancy was that of freedom. I was not taught creed or dogma, and had, therefore, the great advantage of not having to fight my way out of darkness into light. 3. I learnt no creed in my youth. 4. I had no religious instruction at school. 5. No. Freedom of thought was always made a part of the creed practically taught me. 6. No religious creed was ever taught to me. 7. None whatever. In fact, no creed was taught me. 8. My religious freedom has enabled me to look every scientific question fairly in the face. 9. There was no religious coercive education at home, notwithstanding my mother's strong personal religious bent. On the contrary, her influence was quite in the direction of free inquiry, in which she largely indulged herself. My school religious teaching had no effect that I can perceive, either on my intellect or imagination. Its chief result was to make me detest the drudgery of learning catechisms and sitting through dreary sermons. 2, 3, 6, 7, 8 are children of Unitarian parents. Have early abandoned creeds. 1. At estimate 13... I disbelieved as thoroughly as I do now in the religious creed that of the Church of England in which I was brought up, and I had realised Berkeleyan idealism by my own road. Compare this with a reply, too, from a different correspondent in page 130 in the selection. Intellectual interest in religious topics, too. 
none whatever i have long since wholly rejected religious creeds three i gave up common religious belief almost independently from my own reflection this quotation is repeated from the last section the writer's reply to the question of which we are now speaking was a simple no and had been classified as such the religious creed has had a good effect on freedom's research one none i e no deterrent effect rather the contrary two on the contrary three quite the reverse four i think none whatever i have had to overcome some prejudices but my true religious life has been cognate with my scientific one and the former has stimulated rather than crippled the later five certainly not on the contrary it has had clearly the very best effect six not a deterrent effect but it acted as a guide seven never deterred now acts as a direct stimulant since it appears to me that the cultivation of a naturally implanted intellectual tendency is a religious duty the most pernicious influence to which i was subjected was that arising from j stuart mill it took me a long time to work through the sensationalist empirical philosophy and to come out at the other side eight no but the scientific system in calculated long prevented me giving my religious feelings and aspirations full sway has had some deterrent effect one certainly the narrow ism of early youth made me for a long time a timid thinker two to a certain extent yes not in philosophical research but i shrink from the disturbance of mind not fear of ultimate consequences which i know would follow diving into certain questions of the day connected with early religious teachings three no for some time it may have hindered me four it certainly would have had the tendency though not that effect if my researches had taken certain directions five would have been so had i not fought against it six the biblical faith prevented my getting good geological views for many years by having set my thoughts in the old grooves and thus limited them seven i think not i emancipated myself from dogmatic trammels early in life but not without a struggle eight after about ten years careful consideration of the facts called by theology seeming contradictions of science i finally discarded the pentateuchal spectacles which i had previously looked at certain phenomena i laid to early theological teaching so much hindrance in the quest of the most precious of our possessions truth truthfulness a curiosity about facts is much spoken of and implied in the answers to my questions in a few cases it is combined with a curious repugnance to works of avowed fiction a hunger for truth is a frequent ingredient in the disposition of the abler men of every career but in all probability it is felt most strongly and continuously by men of science the most clearly marked characteristic of scientific society seems to me to lie in the careful accuracy with which facts and anecdotes of all kinds are related i have had the good fortune to be acquainted with a large family circle whose curiosity about facts and practice of scrupulous and so to speak artistic truthfulness continuously excite my admiration it has not unfrequently happened to me to hear a remark or statement which i had made to one of its members alluded to by another in which case i have been unusually astonished at the precision with which it was repeated the repetition of the statement retained the precise shade of sense that i originally intended to convey yet it was almost always presented in a simpler and more striking form the essentials had been truthfully adhered to the non-essentials were pruned off and the language was improved the rarity of a faculty like this is easily tested by the experience of the well-known game of russian scandal and has probably been impressed on most of us when we have discovered some misinterpretations of what we did or said truthfulness of expressions adds greatly to the charm of life it gives a grateful sense of confidence towards those who are distinguished for it and it makes conversation more real and far more interesting there is an exact parallel between truthfulness of expression in speech and that of delineation in drawing in the earlier sketch it is far better to be hard in outline than inaccurate subsequent touching up can smooth away the hardness but there exists no proper material to work upon when there was carelessness in the first design End of chapter 2 of English Men of Science Chapter 3, Part 1 of The English Men of Science by Francis Galton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey. Chapter 3. Origin of Taste for Science. Preliminary, Extracts at Length, Analysis, Innate Tastes, Fortunate Accidents, Indirect Motives or Opportunities, Professional Duties, Encouragement at Home, Influence and Encouragement of Friends, Influence and Encouragement of Tutors, Travel in Distant Parts, Unclassed Residuum, Summary, Partial Failures. What were the motives that first induced the men on my list to occupy themselves with science? A question such as this may seem hard to answer, except in very general terms. Those who are but little versed in statistics may be daunted by reflecting on the infinite diversity of characters and antecedents, while those who are will be less easily discouraged. Reiterated experience will have shown them how surely, in every case with which they have dealt, the great majority of causes, or what might be better named pre-efficients, omitted of being analysed and grouped into natural orders, leaving a minority of unclassed influences which themselves form a class of their own and which can be reduced indefinitely in proportion to the minuteness with which the statistician cares to pursue his analysis the statistics of railway accidents will serve as an example when captain douglas galton was secretary of the railway department of the board of trade he succeeded in sorting their causes into the groups in which we have since been accustomed to see them printed year after year so long as the general system of management of a railway is little changed the same statistical ratio is maintained among them a given proportion of accidents being due to this cause and another to that we may therefore estimate with some certainty the saving of life and limb or of material of various descriptions that will be effected when any one of these causes shall be wholly or in part removed similarly my aim is to group the influences which first urged the men on my list to pursue what afterwards became their favourite occupation we shall learn the relative importance of these influences and be enabled to estimate with greater precision than before the value of proposed methods for making the pursuit of science more common than at present the returns i am about to quote are replies to the following questions can you trace the origin of your interest in science in general and in your particular branch of it how far do your scientific tastes appear to have been innate the answers were of unequal length and minuteness from the longer ones i have extracted what was essential and in these and in the rest i have taken a very few editorial liberties as already mentioned at this stage of the inquiry it became advisable to separate the replies according to the branch of science pursued by those who made them i have not kept geography separate because there are not many geographers of my list and those who were admitted of being sorted under other titles with this exception the divisions i have adopted are much the same as those of the various sections and subsections of the british association some doubt may be felt as to how far the replies may be trusted for my own part i believe they are substantially correct judging principally from internal evidence and partially from having questioned different members of several families and finding their opinions corroborative the greatest difficulty i have had in my inquiries generally is due to reticence on the part of the writers who say nothing when much was to be said but even this does not affect relative results again many men are conceited still the forms in which conceit shows itself do not much affect those results thus a too emphatic narration of early achievements does not distort their mutual proportions if men are too proud to acknowledge their indebtedness to natural gifts the relative value may ascribe to motives remains unchanged i am astonished at the unconscious vanity which i have elsewhere met with when making inquiries in hereditary shown by men who owing enormously to natural gifts wish to accredit their own free will with being the real causes of their success one phase of this form of vanity is prominently illustrated by the late john stuart mill in his strange and sad autobiography who declares page thirty that he was rather below par in quickness memory and energy and that any boy or girl of average capacity and healthy physical constitution who was properly taught could make a rapid progress in learning as he did himself as regards the scientific men i find as i had expected vanity to be at a minimum and their returns to bear all the marks of a cool and careful self-analysis my bias has always been in favour of men of science believing them to be especially manly honest and truthful and the results of this inquiry has confirmed that bias 
the influences and motives which urge the men on my list to occupy themselves with science fall under their heads given below i have distinguished each head by a letter and added to each reply the letters that seemed appropriate to its contents the replies have subsequently analyzed according to these letters signification of the letters a fifty nine instances innate tastes m not necessarily hereditary b eleven instances fortunate accidents it will be noted that these generally testify to the existence of an innate taste c nineteen instances indirect opportunities and direct motives d twenty four instances professional influences to exertion e thirty four instances encouragement at home of scientific inclinations f twenty instances influence and encouragement of private friends and acquaintances g thirteen instances influence and encouragement of teachers h eight instances travel in distant regions i three instances residual influences unclassed extracts at length physics one my tastes are entirely innate they date from childhood a two as far back as i can remember i loved nature and desired to learn her secrets my whole life in searching for them while a schoolboy i taught myself botany chemistry etc under great difficulties i had no teacher except a kind apothecary whose knowledge was limited a three from a youth i always preferred the man of marked ability to the man of action alone thrown for so many years of my professional life among men chiefly of the latter class and my sympathies being more drawn towards those in the decided minority my tastes were i conceive not acquired but innate in the early days of my professional career i gained the friendship of blank of the highest professional standing whose acquired general knowledge and love of science and observation were far beyond those of the ordinary blank of his time i was both his young friend and favourite assistant for three years he imbued me with his respect for science and formed my character for earnestness and accuracy to some extent my tastes were determined by events after manhood because in blank, extending over ten years i held positions of great responsibility in different parts of the world but i consider my scientific tastes were formed in youth that is from sixteen to twenty one years of age a f h four from an early age i was addicted to mechanical pursuits in the last few years of my school days i talked to chemistry entered blank college expecting after two or three years there to join a relative's business as calico printer and gave especial attention to chemistry on that account i have never attended specially to physics until appointed professor of natural philosophy this and subsequent similar advancement determined me to devote myself thenceforward definitely to physics and not to try for a chemical appointment a d five naturally fond of mechanics and of physical science in which all my study has taken the direction of those departments bearing on blank owing to my feeling that through the possession of special instruments for investigations in it i could work to greater advantage not from any natural preference for blank over the other departments of physical science a c six my tastes were partially natural partially encouraged by an eminent friend blank, who had been honoured himself by the friendship of most of the leading men of science in the early part of this century a f seven yes i remember incidents which proved an innate taste quoted at length before i could write but i believe the origin of my pursuit of physical science was when i attended the natural philosophy class at blank. i was intended for business but conceiving a distaste for it I left it and attached myself to science a g eight i cannot say except that i had an innate wish for miscellaneous information my interest in science arose from the chance circumstance of my choosing civil engineering as a profession and having spare time when studying at blank which i devoted to blank my scientific tastes were subsequently determined by my not having any profession except civil engineering which i never followed c nine ocean voyaging in beginning of life solitary observing for years in an observatory placed in a country verging on a desert but under southern skies rich in stars unknown to the ancients and not appreciated by the moderns 
d h 10 the origin of my interest in science is mainly due to my father's knowledge of geology navigation and engineering my scientific tastes were confined by lectures by blank and blank and blank and especially by the encouragement of the latter e g eleven primarily derived both by inheritance and education from my father a e twelve my first start was reading a child's story called the ghost where a philosophical elder brother cures his younger brother of superstition by showing him experiments with phosphorus electricity etc this set me on making an electrical machine with an apothecary's file etc when i was about twelve years old my grandfather had scientific tastes to some degree my grandmother's brother blank, was a good amateur chemist and astronomer he was a well-known leader of musical and to some extent of scientific society at blank. a thirteen a mathematical tendency i think led me first towards blank inquiry to which i have been faithful ever since professional duties and civil engineering kept up a disposition to appreciate the material constituents of the world and led through surveying in the direction of physical geography the distinct origin of my desire to place myself among scientific students was the wonderful impression produced on me by the aspect of nature as seen in the blank combined with what i may call the accident of my having been allowed to explore a part of it in an official capacity having thus made rather large botanical and geological collections i came to england with them and while employed in arranging and distributing them picked up a certain rather irregular and unsystematic scientific education in the company of blank and others forced back into professional life special scientific inquiry has not been possible but i have had opportunities of aiding the progress of science which i have endeavoured to make the best of a d f h fourteen largely determined by my service in north polar and equatorial expeditions d h fifteen i am not aware of any innate taste for science i can only remember in boyhood the influence of the philosophical society of blank and of a juvenile philosophical society in which i took interest my interest in astronomy especially was very small indeed until i was appointed to the directorship of an observatory d mathematical subsection sixteen i always regarded mathematics as the method of attaining the best shapes and dimensions of things and this meant not only the most useful and economical but chiefly the most harmonious and the most beautiful i was taken to see blank and so with the help of brewster's optics and a glazier's diamond i worked at polarization of light cutting crystals tempering glass etc i should naturally have become an advocate by profession with scientific proclivities but the existence of exclusively scientific men and in particular of blank convinced my father and myself that a profession was not necessary to a useful life a e f seventeen my taste for mathematics appears innate as a boy i delighted in sums i trace the origin of my interest in general science to my acquaintance with blank which dates from the time when i was about fifteen years of age i taught myself in mathematics and chemistry during my apprenticeship to a civil engineer and land surveyor and subsequently studied blank abroad my scientific tastes were largely developed through my first going to the continent with blank a f eighteen an early taste for arithmetic and in particular for long division sums a nineteen the following is an extract from biographical notes kindly communicated to me of the late archibald smith yachting would give an interest to all nautical matters and the intimacy of his father with blank gave a bias towards magnetism in a letter to one of his sisters no date about eighteen thirty eight he says blank told me he was going to write directions for ships finding and allowing for the error caused by the local attraction of ships so for my own amusement and partially to help him i wrote a set of instructions and gave them to him his mind was thus turned to the subject i think it was natural to him to inquire into the reason of things fond of figures when a boy a b c f twenty my interest in mathematics began at blank university and was mainly due to the energy and encouragement of my tutor blank but professor blank first inspired me with the sense of the magnificence of mathematics g chemistry 
1. Thoroughly innate. My first taste for chemistry dates from the possession of a chemical box when I was a little boy. Whenever I had a chance of turning from other studies to natural science, I always turned. I like to play better than all other work, and in chemistry better than play. A. B. 2. Perhaps wholly innate. My first notions of chemistry were picked up from books, and I got the nickname of experimentalizer at school. My taste for zoology arose through friendship with blank. My tastes were largely determined by three years voluntary work at chemistry under Dr. Blank. A. F. 3. I was always observing and inquiring, and this disposition was never checked nor ridiculed in my childhood. My taste for chemistry dates from the lectures I attended as a boy and to the permission to carry on little experiments at home in a room set apart for the purpose. I was encouraged in my tastes at home. Subsequent determining events were my residing abroad and my mother making a home for me there. A. B. E. 4. They date from a the period, and there was little to produce them in my early surroundings. As a small boy, I was fond of reading books bearing on natural science. I was taught at home with my brothers, and was partially self-taught also. We had always the example of industry, and were encouraged to think for ourselves. I first studied chemistry at blank college a e five from an early age i had an innate taste for all branches of natural science as a boy i made large collections of dried plants minerals beetles butterflies stuffed birds etc at blank i studied without regard to future profession for two years I only took up chemistry as a special study on my third year's residence there a c six i cannot trace the origin i began to study chemistry estimating eighteen and pursued it at such times as my duties in blank gave me leisure and without any instructor the obtaining of correct and accurate results in chemical analysis gave me great satisfaction c seven scarcely innate i ascribe the origin of my scientific interests chiefly to being sent as a pupil to an eminent man of science professor blank subsequently i was a good deal abstracted from scientific pursuits by an early and lasting friendship with blank who directed my thoughts to public work g eight i watched at school the building of a steam engine at a factory and completely got up the whole engine this gave my mind a start blank my father gave me henry's chemistry that and afterwards turner's chemistry were more interesting to me than any books of fiction I believe at one time I read little else but Turner's chemistry and books of poetry in whatever holiday I had. Blank. I owe to my mother a child's curiosity and afterwards a man's reverence for scientific truth. I cannot tell if my scientific tastes were innate. The university invited me to fill the blank chair gave my work its bent. D. E. 9. I can trace my interest in chemistry to reading by accident a book upon it. B. 10. I did nothing, even quasi-scientific, till after leaving college, nothing serious till, estimate, 23. My pursuit of chemistry is entirely due to circumstances occurring after manhood and in direct opposition to family influences. Z. 11. To the opportunity afforded for study of science at blank, my taste received no encouragement whatever from relations my mother accepted. E. Z. Geology 1. Decidedly innate as regards coins and fossils. My father and an aunt collected coins and geological specimens, and I have both coins and specimens which have been in my possession since I was nine years old. Subsequently, my pursuits were influenced to some extent by the discoveries in blank, but at the time I had already a considerable collection. A. C. E. 2. A natural taste for observing and generalizing developed by noticing the fossiliferous rocks which happened to occur in the neighbourhood of the school where I was. Afterwards, the surgeon to whom I was articled, who had an observant mind, fostered my tastes. A. B. F. 3. A natural taste. My interest in science began very early, originating in a love of experiment, at first in chemistry. The ultimate direction of my scientific taste dates after the completion of my regular education. A. C. 4. I believe I may say innate, to a very considerable extent, not remembering that any definite steps were taken to inculcate science. 
I was indebted in a high degree to collections made by my father and mother in blank, and to an early familiarity with charts of those seas, and conversations on matters pertaining thereto. Afterwards, to going to Germany and finding in the mining officers a body of men receiving a regular scientific education. Lastly, to a great extent, by going for a winter to blank in Germany, and by conversations with blank and blank. A. E. F. 5. I was always fond of natural history, collecting plants, insects and birds at school and fossils at college, where blank lectures attracted me to geology and subsequently by the acquaintance of Professor blank to the particular branch of it which I have pursued. A. F. G. 6. As well as I can recollect, they were innate. I remember as a boy of six seeing a spring in Lavender Hill, not being satisfied at the explanation and determined to work it out for myself. I believe that I should have devoted myself to chemistry and physics, but that I was started as a youth of nineteen to travel ten months out of the twelve on business, and so continued for twenty years. This led to my visiting all Great Britain, and to great opportunities for geologizing, and determined me to that study. I worked hard at business all day, a very anxious business, and at evening and night would work hard at chemistry and geology. I found a wonderful relief in science. A. C. 7. I believe the desire for information and habits of observation to be in a great measure innate. They were first developed by a little elementary teaching in physics and chemistry at school, estimated 7 to 13. I worked alone at science at home from the age of 11 years when I was encouraged by the example of an elder brother. Subsequently, my pursuits were much influenced by being thrown at an early age, estimate 19, on my own judgment and resources. I founded a mining colony in the backwoods of blank and had it to carry out with several thousand people quite alone. A. E. H. 8. I was always apt to observe stones closely with regard to their qualities, but the scientific taste for geology was not developed till after manhood. Z. Biology. Zoological subsection. 1. Yes. Inherited from my father's family, who have generally been attached to natural history, especially botany. Most remarkable examples are given. My scientific tastes were largely determined by being appointed. A. D. E. 2. Certainly innate, strongly confirmed and directed by the voyage in the blank. A. H. 3. Love of observation and natural history innate. I had them as early as I can remember. My grandfather was very fond of natural history, and a more distant relative has written an excellent fauna of blank. The help of Mr. has aided me immensely, but not, I think, altered my tendency. A. E. F. 4. Homology innate, and derived from my mother. I trace the origin of my interest in science decidedly to my mother's observations in our childhood rambles on the plants and animals we saw. She told me that crabs were sea spiders and periwinkles, litterants, sea snails. I feel sure she had never read de Maillet. A. E. 5. I believe I inherited my general taste for scientific pursuits from my grandmother, but my choosing, blank, for special investigation resulted from a positive fascination which the very obscurity of the subject exerted upon my mind. It was perhaps a mere desire to unravel the marvellous. My scientific tastes were largely promoted by the attractive teaching of, blank, various professors. A. C. E. G. 6. Thoroughly innate. I had no regular instruction and can think of no event which especially helped to develop it. Bones and shells were attractive to me before I could consider them with any apparent profit, and books of natural history were my delight. I had a fair zoological collection by the time I was fifteen. My father had no scientific knowledge. Nevertheless, he encouraged me in all my tastes, giving me money freely for books and specimens against the advice of friends. But he was indulgent generally, and not in the scientific direction only. A. E. 7. Innate, as far as a love of nature and of the observation of natural phenomena. I trace the origin of my interest in science to the love of truth and of mental cultivation of my father, and his encouragement of this love in his children. I do not think it was largely determined by events after manhood. A. E. 8. I should say innate. I caught all my scraps of lessons for self-improvement. My soon-developed enthusiasm must have been derived from my mother's family 
as to whether they were largely developed by events occurring after manhood i think not all i can say is that neither profession nor marriage nor sickness has been able to affect them a e nine i cannot recollect the time when i was not fond of animals and of knowing all i could learn about them living in the country i had abundant opportunities for indulging my taste though of course i was not allowed to keep half the number of pets i should have liked the example of my father and elder brothers who were all pretty firm to field sports was also followed by me and from field sports to field natural history is but a step i obtained by a piece of sheer good luck the travelling fellowship of blank it was tenable for nine years and its income was sufficient to keep me during that time without being obliged to enter any profession those circumstances subsequently interfered with my using this assistance to the most advantage in gratifying my taste for natural history it was enormously furthered thereby a b c e ten my partiality for the natural history sciences was initiated partially by my selection of medicine as a profession and perhaps even more of that during the period of my apprenticeship i was much under the influence of a remarkable man blank a most accomplished naturalist and of singularly independent judgment blank for three years i spent every sunday morning with him during this time he was constantly stimulating me a willing follower to work in his department of natural sciences and at the same time ever inculcating a spirit of scientific scepticism d f eleven to love of birds their study their dissection i remember trying to find out in the structure of the oviduct the cause of colour and markings in the different eggs i discovered hairs sticking in the cuckoo's stomach arranged in a spiral manner before i knew that john hunter had described the same then i talked to drawing skulls and skeletons and my fate was sealed that i inherited a strong love of nature is certain from my father who was devoted to horticulture and very fond of birds and of landscape scenery but i cannot trace any direct tendencies or work on the part of any member of my family except my brother i feel that i must have had a taste of a science independently of external circumstances at the age of seventeen or eighteen i had dissected every new kind of bird that i met with later opportunities were entirely made by myself or perhaps rather taken advantage of by myself a e twelve my love of natural history so common in boys showed itself in collecting insects shells and birds eggs and delighting in reading such books as stanley on birds whites selborne waterton etc at a very early age eight years or before and being rather encouraged than checked continued to grow till it developed into a fondness for anatomical pursuits generally which was never abandoned my taste for science was entirely innate no other member of the family nor early friend or acquaintance had any special taste for any of the natural history sciences two brothers of nearly the same age and with precisely the same surroundings though joining occasionally in, in some of the above-mentioned boyish pursuits never pursued them with real interest and soon entirely gave them up a e thirteen as a boy i had no taste for natural history but a passion for mechanical contrivances physics and chemistry i earnestly desired to be an engineer by the fact that i had a blank near relative a medical man led to my being apprenticed to him and i took to physiology and anatomy as the engineering side of my profession the inclinations above mentioned were altogether innate and so far as i know not hereditary neither of my parents nor any of the family showing any trace of the like tendencies my appointment to the surveying ship blank made me a comparative anatomist by affording opportunities for the investigation of the structure of the lower animals my appointment to blank forced me to paleontology a c d h fourteen my school nickname was archimedes i was always fond of construction if i had followed my own bent i should probably have been successful as an engineer my turn for scientific inquiry led me in early life to systematize the knowledge of others Laterally, i have felt more interest in original investigations a c fifteen i was in a general atmosphere of scientific thinking and discipline my taste for biology began with keeping insects for chemistry and physics by being led to try experiments largely inherited from my father i have made my circumstances more than they have made me a c e sixteen my father's example influenced me so early that i have no means of judging but i doubt much their innate character their origin was due primarily beyond all probability of doubt 
to my father's influence and example they were not influenced by subsequent events but the tastes once planted rather determined the events my medical profession caused me to suspend my scientific pursuits for some years but the accidental pursual of blank brought me back again to the study of the blank and all the rest followed in due time b e seventeen they appear to have been inherited my interest in science arose from the example of my father and the fact of my being for a year the assistant and close companion of professor blank of blank at whose side i visited the poor in the lanes of blank day and night first began to work and concentrate energies to one branch estimate twenty one when appointed a d e g eighteen they have been i believe nearly in an equal degree the mixed result of a natural bias in education and were determined by professional study when a love of scientific knowledge for its own sake first took possession of my mind a d nineteen how far innate and how far acquired and developed from my early youth i cannot say my love for animals of all kinds was very strong and to gratify it i overcame every obstacle put in my way at home when i was a boy i trace the origin of my interest in science to the earliest impressions of my childhood all of which as far as i recollect them are connected with my father and the various animals he brought me as pets they were not largely determined by events after manhood i should have been an observer of animal life under any conditions under which i might have lived a e twenty i cannot trace the origin of my interest in geology i believe it to have been innate i began collecting birds and studying them before i went to school and without any inducement i was always told by my relations that my scientific pursuits would stand in my way but adhered to them notwithstanding they were not at all determined by events occurring after i reached manhood they simply increased as i grew older a twenty one i perceive no evidence of their being innate hereditary unless i derived any tendency from my mother who was at the time much with her great uncle blank the founder of one of our great industries and greatly interested in his pursuits she worked a good deal at chemistry and was well acquainted with many of the processes in pottery i belonged to an industrious family and saw everyone working the attraction i have for chemistry which is a strong one only my profession has never allowed me to follow it very closely arose from being sent to work estimate fifteen in a chemical laboratory e twenty two i do not consider them innate but induced by the following circumstances when i was at school estimated thirteen to fifteen a lady an old friend of my mother gave me a few british shells with their names and a copy of turton's conchological dictionary i thenceforth diligently collected british shells and afterwards extended my researches b twenty three to my father's example in science to the profession of medicine in physiology anatomy and blank it was my interest in my profession to work at scientific subjects while young and while waiting for practice the example of many men whom i knew when young proved a great stimulus and incentive e d f twenty four not at all innate i can trace it directly to my intercourse with certain professors blank subsequently to my desire to investigate certain scientific questions bearing on medicine and later to my intercourse with blank and blank c d f g biology botanical subsection one my scientific tastes were inborn and strongly hereditary a two as far as the word applies to any case i should say innate excepting such influences as a little encouragement at home i am unable to trace any external stimulus at estimating six i was given joyce's scientific dialogues which i soon mastered then other books before estimating eight i commenced making star maps estimating twelve to thirteen i made some geological sections with tolerable correctness and so on it then seemed as if by accident and the love of new vistas were enough to lead me from one branch of science to another a three always fond of plants a four was always fond of objective and experimental knowledge i take my first efforts of any consequence from an early intimacy with professor blank whose pupil and assistant i was i had a fondness for science before but the necessity for accurate and rigid observation then first dawned upon me subsequent events were going to blank abroad 
and appointments in blank, a foreign country where I was much detained indoors that compelled me to take to the microscope and study of the lower orders of plants and animals, many of which I could grow in my own room. A. C. G. 5. As a youth I followed of my own free will mineralogy, chemistry, anatomy, and mechanics, but chiefly chemistry. My tastes were certainly not hereditary. They were directed to botany purely through accidental circumstances, which led to a prolonged residence in an imperfectly civilized country. I examined its plants, then wholly unknown to Europeans, but was at that time wholly ignorant of the very elements of botany, was subsequently encouraged by blank, eminent botanists of the day, went to and from England and made extensive collections. My wife actively assisted me in my botanical and other scientific pursuits, and to her advice and assistance I owe much of my success in life. A. F. H. 6. The love for botany was instilled into me in very early youth by my father. We lived in the house of blank, a very eminent geologist, in the vicinity of blank, and I often took walks to those hills and collected plants. We also cultivated plants in our garden. A taste for natural science, especially botany, seems to have been innate. The companionship of blank incited me to prosecute botany with vigour. I was one of his best pupils and travelled over a great part of blank with him, e.g. 7. A posthumous account. He appears to have been attached to natural history all his life through, but never took up botany to any extent till the professorship was vacant. There is some conflict of testimony here. I think his scientific tastes were innate. I have excellent drawings of insects made by him as a schoolboy. Also, he made a model of a caterpillar, tried a little chemistry, made lace with bobbins of his own contriving. It was said nothing escapes that boy's eyes. A.D. 8. To my father's encouragement of a natural inclination. A.E. 9. I cannot trace the origin of my interest in any particular branch of science further than that as far as regards blank botany. I was thrown into the society of a gentleman who took much interest in it. My scientific taste originated, as a matter of fact, after leaving blank, the university. F. 10. Not innate. I trace the origin of my botanical taste to leisure, to the accidental receipt of de Candolle's Flore Francaise, whilst resident in that country, and to encouragement from my mother. They were determined afterwards by independence, considering my absence of ambition to rise in the world, and by friendship and encouragement from blank. The four greatest British botanists of the day. B. E. F. Biology. Medical Subsection. 1. In age in a great degree. I trace the origin of my interest in science, 1. To my mother's mental activity and love of collecting and arranging, and my father's constant encouragement of my pursuit. 2. To a friendship of three eminent botanists, by whom I was chiefly induced to study botany. 3. To my profession, the choice of which was, in some measure, determined by my taste for collecting and studying. A. D. E. F. 2. I selected the medical profession because it was that of my father. This choice led me to scientific pursuits, for which I had no previous predilection, as I had no opportunities that way. I conclude the tastes were innate as they certainly show themselves the moment the opportunity for developing them occurred, namely, at the commencement of my professional studies. Estimate 17. A.D. 3. Not at all especially innate. I could have taken to any other subject quite as well, so far as I know. I trace the origin of my interest in science to the knowledge that I must do my best in it to earn a livelihood and to please my parents. I did not follow my own branch from any special liking. Indeed, I disliked it but it was necessary to follow some branch. The connection with the hospital and medical school in blank have been inducements to continue work, and all my life I have worked pretty steadily. D. 4. I cannot perceive that they were innate. Possibly my tastes were due to a retentiveness of memory as to objects and facts, and a strong impression that good surgery is a great fact. Subsequently, by the approval of teachers, when between estimated 18 and 20, having been selected chief assistant to the most popular teacher of anatomy of his day, and also to a professor of surgery, C.G. 5. Had an interest excited in philosophical inquiries by my father's acute observations in all such topics. E. 6. I cannot say that I had naturally a turn for any pursuit in particular. My addiction to medicine was purely the result of accident. 
I never gave a thought to physic as a subject of study until I was twenty-seven years old. D. 7. Accidentally directed to medicine by associating with a medical friend in a superficial study of botany. C. D. Statistics. 1. Certainly my scientific tastes appear to me to have been, so to say, innate. A. 2. My interest in science was due to my having been officially employed in an early part of my career in a very important statistical inquiry. D. 3. Innate, I think. I inherited many mental peculiarities and talents from my paternal grandfather, amongst which is a love of figures and tabulation, none from my father. I cannot otherwise trace the origin of my interest in science, nor were my tastes largely determined by events after manhood. A. 4. I should be much inclined to think there was an innate tendency, but that the tastes were developed by a good and, for the most part, suitable education. When at my first school, estimating ten and a half to twelve, the headmaster gave very clear occasional lessons in moral and economical subjects. I can remember vividly to the present day the impression which those lessons made upon me, as I am not aware that the other boys in the class were equally impressed. I think I must have had an innate interest in those subjects, but the lessons probably increased the interest very much. ABG 5. I cannot distinguish between what I may have derived from nature and what I may have acquired from intercourse with my father and certain of his friends. When I was eleven years old, my father gave a series of lectures on electricity, mechanics, astronomy, and pneumatics, to all of which, but especially to the last, I paid delightful attention. I presently began to construct apparatus for myself. Subsequently, practice in teaching led me to seek for knowledge. Intercourse with men of higher attainments became a great spur. My turn for blank was favoured by my opportunities as an early member of the blank society. A. E. F. 6. Professor Blank's lectures on geology were the origin of my interest in that science. The work of his blank statistical society in educational inquiries influenced my taste for statistical science. Frequent attendance at meetings of the British Association encouraged my scientific tastes. D. G. Mechanical Science 1. If any tastes be innate, mine were, they date from beyond my recollection. They were not determined by events after manhood, but I think the reverse. They were discouraged in every way. A. 2. Decidedly innate. The science of blank was well taught at the University of blank, where I studied, estimated 16 to 18, and accidentally this became serviceable to me when employed as an engineer by blank. The friendship of blank materially affected my career. My tastes were not largely developed by events occurring after manhood. A, B, D, F. 3. Family tradition derived through my mother's side. My profession fell in with my natural tastes, such as sketching. C, D, E. 4. Innate. I think as regards certain qualities of mind, which led me, under the pressure of circumstances, to direct my attention to certain things in a certain way. Namely, 1. Independence of judgment. 2. Earnestness of purpose. 3. A practical, clear-headed, common-sense, logical way of viewing things. C. D. 5. I cannot say whether they were innate. I was always brought up in a half-scientific, half-literary atmosphere, and was a fair mathematician as a boy, as well as a fair classic and linguist. My tastes were not determined by after-events, but my avocations were rather determined by my scientific habits. E. End of chapter 3, part 1